Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. It's a startling statistic that I, I will start the program with tonight. The FBI counted 172 cases of mass killings. That's just between 2006 and 2011. Think of what's happened in the intervening years uh, from 2011 till now. We're talking about mass shootings with a fascinating body of research that Dr. Sherry Towers, an ASU professor, has put together. She's our guest this week on Newsmaker Sunday. Thank you Thank for you being here. Thank you for having here. me. This, um, this paper called Contagion in Mass Killings and School Shootings, your preposition, I guess, is that you believe that mass shootings are contagious to some degree. Yes, so the contagion effect, the copycat effect, has long been suspected. And this is based upon what we've, the writings, for instance, that we've seen some of these perpetrators leave behind. And so you go and you, they basically look at the private writings of these people and find that they had some fascination, for instance, with Columbine. And so because of that, it's long been suspected that there is some kind of copycat effect that plays a role, but it was unknown how strong a role it plays. And what was unique about our analysis is that we approached it from a contagion modeling perspective, sort of what we would do normally like a disease? with diseases, exactly, okay. which okay. is our, which is normally our, most of our background actually, research background is in modeling of disease. And so when we looked at it from this contagion modeling perspective, we were able to quantify the degree of contagion that is in these kind of events, and it's, it's significant, 20 to 30 percent. And what is that time frame where generally one will affect the next? So what we found, so what our contagion model was looking for was the is the hypothesis that when one of these events occurs, it temporarily increases the probability that a similar event will occur. And then that probability just kind of decays away over time. And so on average, the average kind of uh, period of heightened probability is on average about 13 days. So this is to suggest then that somebody on the edge who may not, may not act out when this kind of coverage is presented to them of a mass shooting, it might flip a switch in them to go there? Yes, and so it's been known, for instance, for a very long time that suicides are contagious. So that people being exposed to news about a suicide can be the trigger. That, so clearly it's not like a normal person who is mentally you know, happy who sees a story about a suicide and then goes, decide to, goes and decides to commit suicide. These are people who are already under stress. And so uh, many news organizations voluntarily will no longer report on suicide. So for instance, in New York City, if someone throws themselves in front of a, uh, in front of a subway train, the press by and large in New York City we, chooses we, not to, to cover that. We are in, in the same... That's kind Most of news our, agencies our sensibility from what I understand. as well. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's basically the, been the choice of the news agencies to step back and say, you know, that does, does the public really need to know about this? Is this informative? Well, not really so much in the case of suicides because the primary people affected are the, exactly. you know, the person and the friends and family. And so be, and they found that that actually has, does significantly reduce suicides by trying to interrupt that chain of basically people being exposed to that information. Okay, well now we're getting into the, the million dollar question here. Let's roll tape number one. I covered it for four days in Las Vegas. This was inexplicable as most of these are. So many people lost, so many pe hundreds injured. I mean these scenes are just, um, I, they defy description. Even looking at it now, it's still, I still, you know, the heart rate elevates. This was, this was not an easy story to cover. It was very difficult. But how do you not cover this? I guess the question is then, it's how you cover it. If you're suggesting that media coverage may drive some of this, then we're getting into questions about whether we should be naming and spending a lot of time talking about this man. Yes, so I think one of the things that has to be said first and foremost is that the media has First Amendment rights to cover things as they see fit. So I, what should not happen is that the media be forced to cover these events in a certain way. It has to be voluntary, similar to what has happened with suicides. So that being said, that you know, I, the First Amendment rights of the media should not be infringed, there is the possibility that media can perhaps choose to cover these things slightly differently that will make them, for instance, uh, the coverage less sensational when it comes to giving the details of the actual perpetrator themselves. To not, to not um, elevate them, elevate exactly, their status. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, focusing... CNN, I believe, has been pretty much on the 
front edge of that kind of approach. And I think that's great. I think it's really great that they decided to do that. But in order for it to have an effect, it has to be something that all major news agencies would have to, to buy into in order for a scientist like me to look at the before and after and say, yes, that, that indeed did have an effect. I want to go to tape number two because not long after the Las Vegas shooting, we had the Texas church shooting. Yes. For the first time since the horrific shooting in Sutherland Springs, Texas, the First Baptist Church opened its doors Sunday and allowed the public to see inside. A memorial has been set up in the sanctuary with empty chairs and flowers honoring the 26 people who lost their lives one week ago when Devin Patrick Kelly opened fire during Sunday service, killing nearly half of the congregation. It was the worst mass shooting in modern Texas history. We're not going to take this, what Satan meant for evil, and, and let it destroy us. We're going to come back bigger, better, and, and move forward. Earlier Sunday, the congregation gathered for the first time since the tragedy to pray. They were joined by hundreds of people from the community and perfect strangers for a private worship service in a nearby baseball field. It was led by First Baptist Pastor Frank Pomeroy, who lost his 14-year-old daughter Annabelle in the shooting. God allowed this just as he allowed his son to die. Just as his son rose again, this church will rise again. My family will rise again, and Sutherland Springs will rise again. Senator John Cornyn was one of the people in attendance Sunday, saying the outpouring of support from the community is inspiring. But it's clear they are people of uh, deep faith and that that's what uh, sustains them and gives them hope even during uh, dark times like this. The church will remain open for the time being as a temporary memorial, but there is discussion that the existing sanctuary back there will eventually be demolished and replaced with a new one. In Sutherland Springs, Texas, Casey Stiegel, Fox News. Dr. Sherry Towers from ASU has written a provocative um, paper called Contagion in Mass Killings and School Shootings, saying that there's data that suggests that mass killings often occur in bunches, which indicate that they infect new potential murderers, not unlike a disease. Dr. Uh, Towers with us now. We saw what happened in Texas not long after what happened in Las Vegas. Is there any way to know if those two events may somehow be connected, that in the shooter's mind in Texas, he may have been paying very close attention to what happened in Las Vegas? So one of the problems is that when you look at these events individually, that unless the shooter actually left behind some kind of manifesto, for instance, or writings that said that they had some fascination with these prior events, we can never point to a specific event and say for sure that one was a copycat or basically inspired, contagion inspired event. But what, when we look at the long, you know, you go back quite a few years and you look at all the different, you know, mass killings that have happened and you look at the temporal patterns in there, the hallmark of contagion is that they bunch together unusually together in time, more so than you expect just by them occurring right. randomly. And so when you see a mass killing coming right after another mass killing in a relatively short period of time, there is, there is the potential that that was a contagion-inspired event. How did you decide to even start to research this? So this actually comes from, from my own personal life. Uh, I am a statistician and I'm a mathematician. I'm a modeler. I primarily do modeling of disease is what normally I, my research program encompasses. I also have a consulting company and I was uh, consulting for an engineering group at Purdue University and I was due to meet with them in January 2014. The meeting was canceled because there was a shooting on campus. There was a student walked into a classroom shot another student dead, and then that student walked out, kneeled down, and wait for, waited for the police to come and arrest I, him. I remember this. And so we never did find out why the student did what he did. Uh, he, he committed suicide in jail, unfortunately. But one of the things that occurred to me that day was that that was the third school shooting that I'd heard about in roughly a 10-day period in the news. And I thought, you know, the United States does have a problem significantly worse problem with, with school shootings than any other developed nation. But even for the U.S., which has, you know, does have this problem, that seemed like an unusually large number of mm -hmm. school shootings mm -hmm. to happen in a short period of time. And so it occurred to me, I wonder if like contagion is, is playing a role here. So 
I talked to several of my colleagues about the potential, like maybe we should look at this from a contagion modeling perspective and take a look at this. And so we went ahead and we gathered the data uh, and then did the analysis. One of the hard things about that was when we did the data collection, so USA Today has a really nice database that they right. maintain. Yep. We had to go through event by event and actually verify as, as best we could that the details were correct, in particular the dates of these things, because of course we're looking at temporal patterns. And it was actually very, uh, like uh, when you were talking about watching the, watching the images of, of the Las Vegas event and how it's, it's a physical response. It's almost traumatizing. Mm -hmm. It was actually kind of traumatizing to actually go through these, these events because m many mass killings, the approximately about half, maybe perhaps a little bit more, are actually family mass killings. And so you'd be reading these details of entire families that were wiped out, including babies. And, and we should point out that mass killing under, under the definition, it's four or more victims. Yes, that yes. qualifies as a mass killing. Yes, yeah. What's interesting is, is that um, while only 1% of murders nationally fall under mass killings, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is still, I mean, when it happens, it is just absolutely traumatizing and devastating when you see the kinds of numbers we're dealing with here lately. Yes. Las Vegas. Um, Aurora, Colorado, uh, Texas, mm -hmm. the, and, and are we seeing more frequency? Because there's been a lot of discussion of this, or are the numbers just going up? So the frequency, actually, believe it or not, over the past approximately 10 to 12 years or so, actually has not, it hasn't, there's roughly the same number on average each year. So the frequency really hasn't gone up significantly, but what has gone up significantly is the casualty count in each of these incidents. And that's, that's you know, Sutherland Springs had a very high casualty count, and of course then there's Las Vegas, which right. was the worst ever. Right. Um, what's interesting is that in some of the research on this, that mass killings, most of them, majority, are family related. 51% of victims knew their killer. Yes. This is, not, this is not uncommon. This has not changed over the years. Yes. In terms of mass killings, are we seeing more than we saw, say, in the 60s or 70s? So our, the problem is that um, for, the, for the perhaps somewhat lower, lower casualty count mass killings, the record keeping going back that far is not as, as good as the record keeping recently. And so you never know is the reason that we didn't hear about them you know, or, or know today about once it happened in the 70s, is that because we just have, they were not necessarily recorded. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the social media, you know, spreading of news the way that we do today. So it appears that yes, they are so, it appears that they are somewhat more common today, but again, when you, when you keep on going back too far, it gets harder and harder because to be able to trust the good. data, yeah. Do you, do you have any, can you hazard any kind of theory or guess as to why this is happening? So I, it is clear from our research and from other research that has been done that the dynamics that underlie these things are multifaceted. I mean, it's clear that when you look at uh, high-profile perpetrators of these, of these high-profile events, that even if they hadn't been officially diagnosed with a, with a mental illness, when you hear the anecdotal evidence you know, of uh, friends and acquaintances and family members, Nearly all of them clearly were struggling with some form of mental illness. And it might not have been actually diagnosed, but it was clear that there were issues there. So mental illness is clearly playing a role in many of these events. We find in our study that uh, when we look at the per capita rates of these mass killings by state, and then we look at the state firearm ownership prevalence, that's highly correlated. So availability of firearms is also playing a role. And then, of course, we have the contagion component. So there is a lot of work left to be done to try to understand what are the factors that play into these things when and how you, can we control And it. when you get into that, you're, you're walking into the minefield, right, about a, in America, because you're, you grew up in Canada, you start getting into this debate about gun ownership and gun rights. And that's right. And I think that it always has to be kept in mind that there's a Second Amendment right in, in the U.S. to own firearms, and that should not be infringed. Um, but certainly there are, there are ways, for instance, to 
have laws that prevent firearms from getting to the hands of mentally ill people, of domestic abusers. Many of these people also have uh, histories of domestic abuse, and certainly we saw that in Sutherland Springs, where, where he certainly had a history of domestic do, abuse. Do you believe we can stop this or curtail it? I think it's, it is uh, not going to be easy, let's put it that way. I because think that of the Second Amendment rights in the United States? It's not just... In part, yes, but not in the sense that I'm not saying that in the sense that I think that there any, should anything change with the Second Amendment. I think that it's the when you look at how other first world countries have evolved in their society, that and the way the U.S. has evolved in its society, that the factors that lead to this lead to the current problem that we have here in the U.S. now. It's not something that you can just suddenly take a right turn and make U.S. society like. Canada or something like this. It just is not going to happen. And so to say that suddenly we're going to stop this by suddenly having the same gun laws that Canada has and all this kind of thing, I, I just don't think that it would have immediate impact. Do we think that um, in many of these cases, these people are looking for attention? They are trying to go out with a splash? Because many of these end in their own suicide. Yes. The vast, in fact, the vast majority end in, end in suicide. So, either you, either you know, they commit suicide or suicide. And what we will hear on Facebook, I'll hear it on mine. Yeah, I'm sure you, you hear it on yours. If the person were going to do this or, or wanted to end their life, why didn't they just end their life quietly? Why did they have to take out a bunch of people? Do we know the reason why? I think that the problem is, is that the people who are doing this are, are, in fact, the vast majority are mentally ill. And if you were to actually ask, ask them to explain themselves, I doubt that they would be able to, to articulate why they, why they had chosen to kill a bunch of people, you know, before killing themselves, mm -hmm. if you were to be able to go back and, you know, quiz them. Okay. So I think that the problem is, is that these people themselves probably can't articulate why they did it. I, I think that's, that's probably right. We're going to take a break here on Newsmaker Sunday. We're back in a minute with Dr. Sherry Towers, ASU professor, who's written a very, very interesting paper on contagion in mass killings and school shootings, saying that there is a component of this that looks very much like a spread of disease. There's clusters. We're going to talk about it more with Dr. Towers when we come back. Welcome back to Newsmaker Sunday. We are talking about mass shootings with Dr. Sherry Towers, an ASU professor, and, and she has written a very interesting paper dealing with whether shootings are contagious, whether a shooting will trigger another shooting, and her, uh, her research is fascinating. I want to take, take us to Columbine. This, for me personally, was kind of the moment where the, the light went on, and I, I said, what in the heck is going on here? It appears that, that the two involved in Columbine, the two teens, had paid attention to prior shootings. That's pretty clear. Yes. And so when we talk about a contagion, does the contagion have to spread immediately after the act of another shooting, or can it fester? That's actually a very good question. So there are some, some very impactful events like Columbine, which really kind of changed the game when it comes to... It did, to, didn't it? Oh, in many ways, actually. So, for instance, it has changed the way that police forces respond to these, these, right. these active shooting events. Like, when Columbine happened, basically the police were, were outside trying to get a sense of what was going on inside. And now the police, the police basically have a focus on trying to get, engage the perpetrator as quickly as possible. To stop the carnage. Exactly. To, to pull the attention of the perpetrator away from, from the victims towards, towards, towards law enforcement. So Columbine really was, in many respects, a watershed moment. Um, it was uh, because of the media attention that it got, the number of casualties that were inflicted, there have been many subsequent or several other subsequent perpetrators who, when you look at their writings, had a fascination with Columbine. And so even though it's long past that 13-day window, it is quite possible that high-impact, high-profile events have a longer contagion period than others. And that is certainly a very interesting area of future inquiry to look into. We that. talked about this in the first segment, but is the, media, the media's role in this is very important, is it not? Yes. As you've looked at this, how it's covered and how the perpetrators are covered could be very important going but forward. Potentially, yes. And so, for instance, with many of these events where you have, the, where you have a high casualty count, um, there, 
there will be oftentimes what I see in the media coverage is that in the first 24 to 48 hours, it's talking about kind of the event itself. And then in the, in the subsequent days, it moves on to focusing on victims and then also on the perpetrator, where there will be incredibly in-depth articles about the perpetrator themselves. People want to know. People want to know. They want to know why someone would do this. Yes. But sometimes the articles, I, I think, go into perhaps more detail than they need to. Um, in so order are we for, glorifying these people in some way? Oh, glorifying. For, for the people who are mentally ill who might be... Who might be uh, prone to actually being infected with the idea to try to copycat these things, they may see it as glorification. Like, look at all this media attention that this person got from, from doing this thing. Look, they're focusing on him as life. They're talking all about him. To them, it might seem glorification. I think to the average person, they don't see it as glor glorifying. They see it as, but as to someone informative. On the edge. Exactly. If someone on the edge, there it is. They would perhaps pot potentially see it as glor glorification. What, what came out of your research that also surprised you? So uh, some of the things we looked at were the firearm ownership problems, which we've all already talked about, right. that there does seem to be a high correlation. We also tried to look at mental illness. So we looked at state rates of mental illness. And it's a little bit hard to quantify because how do you quantify severe mental illness? And there's not too, many, not too much data available on that. But we did have uh, state estimates, for instance, of, of depression, rates of depression. And we found that there was no s significant correlation between, between that. Between depression and mass yeah, shootings. Yeah, mental so, illness as evidenced by depression and then these mass is shootings. Is there a particular segment of mental illness or a diagnosis that seems to feed into mass shootings? So that's, that, that or, again gets to whether or not these people were actually diagnosed and most of them were not. Most of them, you look back at their histories, and you know it was very clear that they were they were struggling with some kind of mental illness. But most of them had never been officially diagnosed with something. Which raises a huge problem if you're trying to screen these people from buying exactly. a firearm. Exactly. Yes, very much so. Very much so. And that can there there may be aspects of of access to mental health that may be playing a role in the U.S., particularly since in the U.S., if, if these people are, for instance, in a lower income bracket where they just cannot afford... Access to care. Access to care, exactly. We're going to take a break. Dr. Sherry Towers, ASU professor and the author of Contagion in Mass Killings and School Shootings. Back in a moment on Newsmaker Sunday. Dr. Sherry Towers, our guest on Newsmaker Sunday. She is an ASU professor, author of a fascinating paper called Contagion in Mass Killings and School Shootings. The basic predicate is that shootings may be contagious, that other shooters react to shootings before them and may trigger them. And that's uh, the basis of, of her research. Do you think we're going to see more of this going forward? More research? Uh, we'll get to the research in okay. a minute. More shootings. Yes, of course. I mean, this is the, the rate of these things has been fairly constant over the last 10 years. I would fully expect that, the, that it continue on as it has been for you know, the past 10, 20 years, just because w what has changed to make it become less, less uh, prevalent. My only question to that would be, um, do we become an, in, at a point desensitized where these don't become as big of a splash because People start to accept this and say, you know, this is going to happen. Oh, another shooting. Now it isn't the splash that it once was. One of the things that I have personally noticed is that it appears, and this is not, I can't, I can't put a, you know, quantify it directly, but one of the things I've noticed is that the media coverage seems to be, as time goes forward, seems to be, the, the time frame for media coverage of these events seems to be shorter and shorter and totally shorter. Totally agree with you. Yep. And, so, and I think that's pushed by social media. Mm -hmm. A the part of it. And I also and think that people are becoming immune to it almost, like the, the less shocked when it, when it actually occurs. Do we know what effect that might have on potential perpetrators? The fact that people become desensitized. No, I, we don't actually. And that's a, that's a, that would be an interesting area of future research. Okay, to try you to think there that. needs to be more research in this area, and it really dropped off after 1997? Yes. So in 1997, Congress passed what's called You've the Dickey Amendment. You've got about 30 Amendment. seconds. And they, they basically said that uh, there should be no federal funds grant money available for research into firearm violence. And this was under pressure from the gun lobby. For the past 20 years, most Americans are not aware that because of the Dickey Amendment, researchers like myself cannot get 
federal funding to fund our studies. We did this study on the side as basically something we were doing on the side with our regular research also doing that. Well, it's brilliant research. It's Thank very, you. very interesting and uh, proud that, that ASU was part of it. Thank you Thank very you. much. Dr. Sherry Towers, our guest on Newsmaker Sunday. We'll see you next week on Newsmaker Sunday.